we continue with session with uh, Professor uh, James Richardson from uh, University of Nevada, which is internationally known as an expert of the relationship between religion, particularly new religious movements and religious minorities and the law. And he will cover particularly the role of the European Court of Human Rights in cases uh, concerning the Jehovah's Witnesses. So, uh, Jim Richardson, the floor is yours. I'm Jim Richardson from the University of Nevada, Reno. I'm happy to have been invited to participate in this conference, and I very much appreciate the assistance given to me by the legal arm of the Jehovah's Witnesses and others furnishing information that I needed. Uh, Mike is on the rights of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia and beyond. There's some implications that I'll talk about of the Russian cases we'll discuss, uh, particularly focusing on the European Court of Human Rights and actions it has taken uh, with reference to the witness cases, of which there are many. Uh, my first slide is just for those who may be uninformed, but I think most of this audience is informed about the early history of the Jehovah's Witnesses, how large they are, 8 million members worldwide, and the fact that they have developed a remarkable uh, ability to defend themselves and promote their beliefs and practices in courts of law in Western countries. Uh, I cite a paper there, Ote and I wrote uh, two decades ago nearly, that describes some of that early history. Uh, you may want to look at that later. Uh, I wanted to first of all talk about uh, some of that history in the United States where the witnesses actually filed hundreds of cases between the, in the, from the 1930s and 40s, mainly over their proselytizing practices. And they have developed a very impressive record in the United States. They've won over 50 of those cases and held expel the so-called Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution governments. It did not apply to local and state governments initially, but Jehovah's Witness cases and cases brought by some other minority religions in America have helped establish the freedom of religion, the freedom of association, the freedom of expression provisions in the United States Constitution in that Bill of Rights. But uh, these cases have also helped establish conscientious objection rights, medical treatment rights, rights of parents to raise their children within a religion, uh, the custody cases, and other things as well. So it's a, quite a remarkable record in America. Uh, then about a decade later in the 50s, uh, the witnesses uh, were able to do something similar in Canada. It turns out that in Canada from 1940 to 43, they were actually banned because of their refusal to support the war and they suffered very serious discrimination as a result. But uh, after that, uh, they were able to file a number of cases in the 50s and won those cases, including even a very famous case against the premier of Quebec who was uh, conspiring, working with the Catholic Church to try to uh, stop the witnesses from their work in Quebec. So these, these uh, cases in Canada also contributed to the movement toward the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that is now the, the law in Canada and helps protect religious freedom there for the witnesses and others. Some background on what happened in Europe, obviously during World War, uh, to the witnesses suffered greatly, as did many others. Uh, nearly a couple of thousand of them, I think, were put in uh, concentration camps and many of them died. But in the post-World War II environment, uh, there was a, an agreement among the nations on the winning side of that war that uh, something should be done to help protect human and civil rights in the future. And so the Council of Europe was established in 1949. 
uh, they developed those nations, original members of the Council of Europe developed the Convention for Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, which was approved in 1950 and finally made effective in 53. And that included Article 9 on freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and a number of other articles very important to the establishment of religious freedom in Europe. The European Court of Human Rights itself was established to enforce the convention, uh, but it's worth noting that Article 9 was not enforced for four decades until 1993, with a case we'll discuss later, the Kokonakis case, a witness case out of Greece. Um, that occurred in 1993. Prior to that, the court uh, granted a great deal of what's called margin of appreciation to the original member states. Uh, they assumed that uh, these states knew how to manage religion and grant religious freedom. And so nothing, uh, there was no Article 9 case uh, won, even though some were filed by the witnesses and other groups prior to 1993. You were familiar with that, so I'll read through it. Uh, you should note that uh, the uh, Second part of Article 9 does allow some leeway, and that's uh, much discussed and contested in some of the cases we'll be talking about. I thought I would list for you other articles that have been cited in now uh, 57 current cases filed by the witnesses and accepted, uh, granted admissibility against Russia. That's by far the largest number of cases uh, involving uh, religion before the court right now and involves the majority of cases pending from Russia as well. So we see Article 3, Prohibition of Torture and Inhumane Treatment, 5, Right to Liberty and Security, 6, Right to a Fair Trial, 6, Respect for Private and Family Life, 10, Right to Freedom of Expression, 9, Right to Assembly, 13, Right to Effective Remedy, 14, Prohibition of Discrimination, including religion, and then Protocol 1, Article 1, Protection of Property. So these are all articles that have been cited along with Article 9 violations in claims made against Russia by Jehovah's Witness cases in Russia. Here's a little bit of early history on the witness cases. <clears throat> I mentioned the Kokonakis case in 1993. It involved a, a Kokonakis, who was proselytizing, he had been arrested about 60 times himself and fined and put in jail. Uh, this particular case was applied, uh, submitted to the European Court of Human Rights. They accepted it uh, in, I think, 1988. And in 1993, they finally ruled that there was a violation of Article 9 in this case. It was a split vote, by the way. It wasn't unanimous. This case was made possible uh, really because Greece was one of the original members that made it a criminal offense to proselytize, a very strange law that was uh, put on the books um, when democracy was reachieved in, in Greece. I think the timing was very propitious and I've even called this one unquote pilot judgment unquote of the court. Uh, in the, as we know, the Soviet Union had just as thought many of the former Soviet nations, uh, dominated nations, wanted to join the Council of Europe, even though most did not have a history and a culture uh, supporting religious freedom. They either uh, opposed religion overtly or they had a, a national uh, religion that did not uh, uh, approve of religious freedom for minority religions. Uh, since 1993, there have been a flood of successful Article 9 cases and related articles that I mentioned above, uh, many of them involving Jehovah's Witnesses, with most of them coming from former Soviet-dominated countries and, of course, Greece, which never took off its statute criminalizing um, proselytizing. Here's a record uh, of the witness cases before the European Court of Human Rights. From 1964 through August of this year, 
There have been a total of 300 witness cases filed with the European Court of Human Rights from many different Council of Europe countries, but most of them are coming from Russia and other former Soviet-dominated regions. Uh, the witnesses, witness plaintiffs have won, however, 66 cases. They've had 25 friendly settlements, which means the government agreed to settle the cases with them in a, a way uh, that uh, was positive for the witness plaintiffs. And in two particular cases, the uh, government just gave up and filed a unilateral declaration uh, agreeing uh, with the plaintiffs and not even bothering with a friendly settlement. So that's a total of 93 favorable outcomes, an unbelievable and impressive record. The witnesses lost two cases, but one of those involving conscientious objection was overturned later when the court finally decided uh, to support conscious objection as a right of witnesses uh, in the Council of Europe region. Uh, 98 were declared inadmissible. Most of those were dealing with conscious objection uh, and they were declared inadmissible before the European Court finally ruled in favor of the conscious objection cases. Of the 98 pending cases involving Russia and other countries, 60 have been communicated to governments involved, which means the court has asked the nation being challenged in these cases to respond to the claims being made. So that's quite a record that they've achieved in front before the European Court of Human Rights. They've won friendly settlements or, or won cases and achieved unilateral declarations in cases involving registration, taxation, censorship, uh, freedom of expression, uh, child custody, deportation, confidentiality of medical records, uh, the lack of neutrality of the state, conscious objection, and disruption of meetings. And it's worth noting in passing that even France, the home in Strasbourg of the Council of uh, European Court of Human Rights, has even lost an Article 9 case in 2010 involving the witnesses the French were attempting to drive the witnesses out using their tax laws, and that turned out to be unsuccessful. But the pending re Russian cases are very troublesome and have many implications, which we'll talk about toward the end of the presentation. Currently, as I said, there are 57 cases from Russia pending before the court, some dating as far back as 2015 and 14. 22 of those cases have been under consideration since 2015. 33 of them have been communicated to the Russian government, which means the court has asked for the Russian government to explain itself in terms of these cases. And some of those cases have even granted what's called Rule 41 status, which allows cases to jump the queue and be fast-tracked because of the urgency of the issue. And those Rule 41 status cases generally pertain to the ruling in April, uh, the National Organization of the Witnesses and authorized the confiscation of their property. Here's a list of those 57 cases. I won't read <clears throat> through all of this, but uh, you can see the many issues that have been involved in those cases. The largest number, 21, involved detention or criminal conviction for practicing their religion but there have been 11 involving raids and then uh, eight involving censorship of material and the website, and then a scattering of cases that uh, have involved other complaints of the witnesses that have been brought, uh, citing certain articles, Article 9 and other articles in the European uh, Convention. It's worth noting that at the time the April 2017 action was taken, there were actually 3,500 witness congregations involving 50 to 250 individuals in each one. And there were about 395 local religious organizations, one in each major city in Russia. All these local congregations and uh, citywide 
organizations were affiliated with the national organization entered in St. Petersburg before it was dissolved. At the time of the ban, the witness had a total of 401 properties in Russia that they owned with an estimated value of about $70 million. And as of August 2020, 236 of those properties have been confiscated, a total value estimated at over $52 million. It's worth noting also that over 1,100 witness homes have been raided since the 2017 Supreme Court ruling, and that 275 of those homes have been raided even during Uh, very little attention being paid to the health risk of those involved with those raids. There have also been a number of criminal actions against witnesses in Russia, that uh, many of which have been uh, involved in the complaints in the European Court of Human Rights that are being considered by the court. There are currently 166 criminal cases in process in Russia involving 379 people. 47 are pending and 119 are in preliminary investigative stages. 10 people, 10 witnesses are already serving prison sentences from two to six years. 34 people are in jail awaiting trial, some for up to two years. And 30 people are under house arrest. And at the bottom of this slide, there's a link given to the witness uh, website that up, updates these uh, figures on a daily basis. There are a lot of implications of the European Court of Human Rights decisions for witnesses and for other minority religions. It's worth noting that witnesses are now registered and active in most Council of Europe countries. Russia is, of course, a major exception. Uh, witnesses can usually pursue their beliefs and practices in nearly all of the Council of Europe countries, 47 of them. Although they do experience harassment in some areas, particularly in former Soviet dominated areas. But it's worth noting a very important thing that other minority religious groups have also gained rights from the many legal battles uh, being fought by the witnesses. There are other implications. The uh, Article 9 and other articles relevant to religious freedom are being enforced more often by the court in its decisions. It seems to be giving less deference to the margin of appreciation, particularly in countries that have not had a history and a culture of allowing religious freedom. Uh, what initially looked like a double standard between original and newer members uh, of the Council of Europe from former Soviet-dominated countries it needs to be looked at more carefully. It's more nuanced. Uh, there is a major thrust of those decisions involving the witnesses and other religious groups from former Soviet dominated countries, allowing those groups, religious groups, to at least exist, which has been a major problem in some of those nations and also in France. Uh, there's less of a focus on individual religious freedom issues with Article 9 case law, but some of the witness cases do involve individual freedom claims, not just the right of an organization to exist. There are other implications, of course, uh, broad implications. I've already mentioned about courts in uh, U.S. and Canada allowing the witness cases uh, to go forward, establishing very important precedents for religious freedom, for the witnesses, as well as other groups. But in both uh, the U.S. and Canada, uh, the courts also have been using witness cases and other minority religion cases to expand the, the authority of the court in the United States over state and local governments, and in Canada over uh, actions of uh, the provinces and other local governments there as well. And I have already mentioned the establishment of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada that the witnesses contributed to. It's, it's worth noting in Europe, the court has obviously been using witness cases to expand its own authority uh, over these former Soviet dominated nations. 
letting them know that not only will they uh, enforce Article 9 and related articles concerning religion, but that the court will be countries as well. But uh, it's a, a very serious question about what's going to happen with these Russian cases. Um, Russia has a has lost a number of cases involving the witnesses and other religious groups, and its typical response is to not change any of the laws, to simply pay the fines that the court has uh, rendered against Russia, and do nothing to change its practices and its laws. So that that could happen. Uh, there's implications for the future of the Council of Europe. I say I, itself, I think, because uh, Russia is refusing to change its laws. And in fact, the recent changes that uh, Putin uh, got passed by in Russia makes it even uh, more clear that Russia does not need to abide by the rulings of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. That would put it in obvious violation, clear violation with the convention that Russia is a signatory to uh, which calls on Russia to abide by the rulings of the court, abide by the Convention of Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Uh, so there's a real collision uh, going to occur in the very near future, I think, when the court finally rules on these Jehovah's Witness cases. I don't see how it can avoid ruling in favor of the witnesses in most of those cases. She will do remains to be seen. So with that, I'll close my presentation. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate. If anybody is interested in talking to me about uh, this presentation and these cases, uh, my email address is on the very first slide of the presentation. I'd be happy to communicate with you further. Thank you very much.